year ago, the armies of the United States and seven other countries massed in the Arabian Gulf, preparing to free Kuwait from the occupying army of Iraq. Oil was a key factor in the conflict, and in the months before the fighting began, the risks of environmental catastrophe were obvious, as deadly oil slicks spread down the Gulf. When the shooting started in January, Iraqi soldiers were slaughtered in their thousands by the most sophisticated weapons in history. But Saddam Hussein resorted to an older weapon of his own a scorched earth policy to deny the victors what he could not take by force. In the hours before Baghdad surrendered, the oil wells of Kuwait were set ablaze by Saddam's retreating army. Over 700 wellheads were destroyed by explosives and the black gold of the desert now fueled an inferno. Liberated Kuwait was in flames. The victorious allies advanced into a country engulfed by fire and choking black smoke, and everywhere, the pitiless carnage of war. There are six major oil fields in Kuwait. Ahmadi, Burgan, Wafra, Managish, Rodatain, Sabriya. Before the Iraqi invasion, more than 900 wells produced crude oil worth more than $35 million a day, $12 billion a year. Kuwait's oil reserves are the third largest in the world, and this was the prize that thousands of soldiers had fought and died for. Oil is a basic ingredient for the Western economies, which cannot be denied in the absence of a true economical alternative. Oil will remain for the next uh, 30 to 40 years, as is projected. So oil did play a large uh, part in deciding Let's assume the other side of the coin. Had we been just a plain desert and uh, or a, a, a bunch of Bedouins roaming the desert, do you think the West would have interfered? Oil. Always the issue of oil. Sell the people, sell everybody else. Keep the oil flowing. The sands of the desert drifted across Saddam's dreams of conquest, covering the bodies of the slaughtered. And the oil burned and flowed into no one's hands. The United States had led the coalition to free Kuwait. Now it mobilized the resources to put out the fires that were costing nearly $250 million a week in lost revenues and threatening an environmental catastrophe. The massive task began. At airfields across North America, the US Strategic Airlift Command lifted giant cargo planes with men and equipment bound for the oil fields of Kuwait. The firefighting know-how of the United States oil industry faced its toughest ever test. It was not unexpected. Before the fighting started, the Kuwait Oil Company approached specialists in the United States, asking them to prepare plans to deal with a large number of oil fires. Though they had not expected there would be quite so many.
some of the people who were here got out of the country and they told us uh, that there were explosives on these wells. We knew there were about a hundred at that point that had been basically mined. And out of that, we figured that it would be about 70 or so of them that would require repair. We began to plan for the equipment that would be needed for each blowout control team. And by the time the shooting quit, we were ready to move. Never before had the world seen entire oil fields set ablaze. There were fears the task would be beyond the means of the four small firefighting companies that had been selected to fight the Kuwait fires. There were three Texas-based companies, Red Adair, Boots and Coots, and Wild Well Control, and one Canadian company, Safety Boss. Each company had just two teams of firefighters. Each team made up of four specialists and three mechanics just 58 men to deal with more than 700 blazing wells. Until now, the most fires they'd ever faced at one time was five. Arriving in Kuwait, they set to work, trying to establish some order out of the chaos they'd landed in, already realizing that their experience was the only thing going for them. First thing you have to worry about is getting your mind back in organization and all that. It's unbelievable, all of the things that you see here. You start out on a project like this, uh, the way they've worked it here is each one of the four major firefighting teams has been given a sector to work on the wells in that given sector. Beforehand, uh, if equipment's not here, you have to organize that, get it coming. Some of the equipment we build here ourselves Equipment has to arrive, has to be assembled, has to be tested. Once all of that is in order, then you can move out on your first well and begin your operation. For all of the support services and those people that were sent to be uh, uh, assistants and laborers and helpers, uh, right down to a dump truck driver, uh, when you throw him in the situation of uh, uh, darkness and uh, a loud roar, the ground is vibrating, and they do not understand technically what's taking place, so uh, fear sets in. But as soon as you make them comfortable with uh, the fact that the well is doing all that it can do, it doesn't present any further uh, danger to them, uh, comes along rather quickly after that. I couldn't work on the cement line in the factory. I'd go bonkers, you know, but, uh, you know, we go to different countries where you see different uh, cultures and everything and, and uh, different wells and each one of them is different so you have to not only know the basics but be able to uh, improvise to uh, meet whatever needs are necessary at that time. We had to make do with uh, very little equipment and uh, we put out the, some of the smaller fires, the fires that were blowing straight up that we could put out with a small amount of water which is a thousand barrels is what we were working with out of tanks they were hauling the tanks from one job to the next. While the firefighters prepared for their awesome challenge, the fears of what effect the fires might have grew more alarming and pessimistic. There was talk of irreversible global pollution, of the Asian monsoons being disrupted and harvests ruined, of vast regions overtaken by darkness and contamination by the dense black smoke churning out from a nation on fire. Headlines carried warnings by scientists of a climatic catastrophe. the onset of nuclear winter as Kuwait's fires blotted out the sun. The pollution from six million barrels of oil a day was pouring into the atmosphere, and the wind and rain would quickly transport this around the world. 
in Kuwait, immense columns of foul smoke belch miles into the sky as the hellfires roared. Whatever happened would rest on the firefighters' efforts. They were the spearhead of what was intended to become a huge task force, over a thousand support workers backed by millions of dollars worth of essential equipment. All of it brought together in the town of Ahmadi in the middle of the oil fields, the home of the Kuwait Oil Company. After the months of military activity, American Forces Radio now had a quickly growing civilian audience. At times, it seemed as if Kuwait had become a colony of Texas. There had been advanced planning, but would it be enough? Early forecasts said it would take years to extinguish the flames, even with the best technology. And though some equipment was already in Ahmadi, from the beginning there would be a serious shortage that would hinder the fire crews. There was a twofold problem that would create growing headaches for the firefighters. The devastation that came with the Iraqi invasion had left Kuwait an empty shell. Offices and homes had been stripped of furniture and equipment. Technical records and files had been ransacked and burned. Kuwait had been gutted. Kuwait city itself was a ghost town wind blown like the desert from which it sprang. The telephone system was useless. Electricity and fresh water, non-existent. 50,000 vehicles had been destroyed. The local economy was in ruins. The return of the Emir solved nothing. Martial law remained, and government had all but ceased. Political paralysis was compounded by a conflict amongst the leading figures in Kuwait. Who would receive the vast sums of money paid as commission to import the equipment that the firefighters desperately needed? In Kuwait, with the infrastructure completely destroyed, everything had to come in. So the organization problem was one of procuring material, getting to the right place at the right time, and re uh, acquiring those services that uh, normally are available such as water trucks, pump trucks, transportation, all of those things uh, have to be coordinated and therein lies the problem that we had. Contracts, getting contracts written was terrible. That uh, everybody wanted to get their hand on them and they ended up with 35 signatures. Seriously. And all of a sudden we find purchasing agents who, when they look at bulldozers, they say, I can't imagine they need bulldozers to scratch them. They haven't the slightest idea what they're doing. In the short term, they're saying we're losing $120 million a day, but at the same time, they're haggling uh, with the contractors over the, the uh, ten or $20,000 uh, uh, equipments. And we know for sure that uh, they had the advice that these oil wells were uh, up to go on flames around in October 1990, but no contract was signed till February, end of February 1991. We didn't get any equipment until sometime late March and April was the first thing we saw come in here to work with. But there was another problem. The blazing wells themselves each had their own complex idiosyncrasies, depending on how the Iraqis had blown them apart. The problem was even worse if it was a large, high-pressure well like this one, Well 120. This giant fire straddled the road into Ahmadi, its huge flame towering over the blackened landscape. Red Adair and his team had been working on 120 for over a week with no success. Even at the best of times, 120 would be hell itself to put out. It's one of the larger ones that we've dealt with in this particular field. I was told it's capable of 10,000 barrels per day to a very small choke. So, you know, anyone's guess, maybe making 20, 30,000, nobody knows. At one point, 
point I put an explosive in there, but at that time I couldn't even see the well here. And I managed to remove some more of the debris and the, uh, we call it coke buildup. It's the unburnt oil that solidifies. The main problem is that the fire is going two vertical, or two horizontal and one vertical. Like you can see now in the background there, with the wind blowing, it rolls the one back over the wellhead so that you can't, it's almost impossible to extinguish one when they're, when they're blowing like that. Many wells had been ablaze for months. The damaged wellheads were clogged by a thick sludge of unburned oil residues and sand. The teams used a specially built crane jib to rake away this sludge and assess the damage. The heat from the fires is enough to melt steel, up to two or three thousand degrees at the center. Water is poured onto the flames to cool the furnace-like air around the wellhead and give the teams a chance to get in closer. The work goes on for days until the team decides to expose the wellhead with a charge of dynamite. Explosives, enough to make a medium-sized bomb, are packed into an oil drum and carefully primed. It's a delicate, highly dangerous operation. Explosives are nothing more than an expedient tool. And uh, in wall wall control, we use it quite a bit, and it speeds up the job and then cuts down the uh, time we spend on each blowout. And that's to the customer's satisfaction. Two or three hundred pounds of dynamite wrapped in asbestos are carefully placed into the heart of the fire. The asbestos must withstand a temperature of 2,000 degrees and the suppressed tension affects everyone on the site. The massive explosion blows away tons of rubble and coke. No matter how experienced they are, the risks to the firefighters are always there. Well, it only takes one mistake. <laughs> you know, I'm sure everybody's a little apprehensive at times, but uh, now we're, we set it down and, and it's not a wham bam thinking ma'am job. It, it's a, a very thought out, very thorough. Should there be an accident, uh, what we're gonna do at that time and everything, uh, of course, you can't have a dress rehearsal. The coke has been cleared, but the fire remains. The hellfighters will have to return another day. afternoon in Kuwait. Over a hundred oil fires have been put out, but a surreal darkness blankets the city. When winds carry soot and oily smoke from the southern oil fields, the eerie blackness dispels any optimism that the firefighters are winning their dangerous battle.
Next day is as black as deepest night, lit only by the lurid glare of the oil fires. Headlights are useless, unable to penetrate the oily soot hanging in the air. On days like this, work grinds to a halt, except for maintenance jobs in the machine shops and pipe yards. The inactivity sharpens criticism that the firefighters are moving too slowly. I've heard too much criticism, I'm up to here with it. And it's not like in having one bicycle and 10 people trying to ride it. You get too many people, you're not gonna get anything done. And the people you got the best in the world doing it here, and as far as that, we got enough people. The thing we need is more equipment. The Gulf War may be over, but Saddam Hussein's grim legacy is clear to see. The country has been consumed by fire. The smashed wells spew forth millions of gallons of oil in a fine spray, hundreds of feet into the air. It covers the landscape, coloring everything a dirty black and brown. In the desert, this black rain has created swamps, oil lakes, and islands, a foul terrain that now forms the backdrop to the unrelenting work of the fire crews as they move deeper into the oil fields to the south and west of Akhmadi. Dynamite is used more and more to clear away debris around the wellheads. The dull thud of explosions is now a constant sound, as the size of the explosive charges increase daily, and they are used to extinguish the fires themselves. Snuffing the fire, no, that's a kind of a by guess and by God uh, type of thing, you know, just through experience we know that it might take 100 pounds or it might take 500. We we'll used 250 on this one here just to make a bigger boom. That one, uh, when we shot it yesterday, it didn't seem like it was that much concussion. We were upwind, but I think we used 250 on this one here. You want to go with enough, so you just do it one time. Because after you shoot it, you tear up your monitor stands and you tear up some aluminum pipe and blow all of the tin off of your dozer and everything. So uh, naturally, you'll want to get it right the first time. In an instant, the massive blast snuffs out the flame. And where there was fire, now there is oil. One thing that has concerned us, and when we shot this well out here, it was a big fire. When we shot it out uh, the day before we wanted to shoot it, but there was a sandstorm. And we put 200 pounds of explosives in the shot drum, and you don't want your head down that drum with all the static electricity around. That's, that's pretty dangerous. Dangerous or otherwise, in the rest of the oil field, the flames rage on. But the real danger comes when the fires are blown out. The fire is the lesser of the evil. That, that, there's nothing to that. I mean, a troop of brownie scouts can put that fire out. It's the rest of it that counts. And that's the more dangerous part of working on one. When you're up there removing that old wellhead and there's oil spray going everywhere, if it should ignite at that time, you'd have some people burn. In fact, that happened here just a few days ago. Three guys got burned. Not seriously, thank God, but not with our team, obviously, either. In the oil firefighting business, the technical details are always larger than life. The oil surges up to the wellhead from deposits a mile and a half inside the earth, rushing to the surface with the speed of a jet engine. To cool the wellhead for safe inspection, 4,000 gallons of seawater a minute are pumped through high-pressure hoses. The oil itself has been burning at temperatures above 3,000 degrees. The ground remains hot enough to boil water for days afterwards.
But the abiding fear is always of a sudden, lethal explosion of the volatile mixture of gas and oil. Even when the fire is out, oil still rains down over the desert. Millions of dollars a day sinking into the sands. The firefighting teams must now cap the well, the most dangerous and the most exhausting stage of blowout control. At any one time, three or four wells are being capped. Some are far tougher than others. First, a giant valve called a blowout preventer has to be secured over the damaged oil pipe before the gusher can be stopped. The blast of escaping oil is deafening. The stinging mist of oil and gas covers the body, clogging eyes and invading the ears and lungs. Beyond the million dollar equipment and enormous support teams, success in the end depends on the Herculean efforts of men like these. Taming a blazing well is a complicated, high-risk job. First, the fire has to be put out. What's left of the wellhead has to be repaired. The blowout preventer has to be worked into place. And once this is done, the oil flow is then closed off and mud is poured down the well, stopping the flow of oil. John Wayne made a movie in 1968 called Hellfighters that, you know, kind of glamorized the business. Believe me, it's not that glamorous. Indeed, glamour is not a word that springs readily to mind. With the job comes a 12-hour day, seven days a week for a month, in temperatures of over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. At the end of an exhausting day, there's only enough time to eat and tell a few jokes before grabbing some sleep in the Ahmedi guest house. In West Texas one time, there was a small independent oil company that had a catastrophe like you see here on these individual wells, but they didn't have enough money to afford the well control teams that existed at the time, so they hired a, a small outfit for a low rate. The day they were supposed to show up, the uh, company drilling foreman was up on the bluff watching that road across the desert for hours and hours and hours, and these guys were already three hours late. Finally, he stationed one of the other crew members up there. He says, I'm gonna go try to call this guy, so you watch, and if you see him coming, you let me know. Well, about an hour went by, and. It, Hand came running up there and he said, I think they're coming. I see a dust cloud across the desert there. The company hand goes up, and sure enough, here comes this 18 foot stake bed truck. 100 people hanging out of there, all with a burlap bag. And they run up to that well, and ran right into it. The truck crashed into the well. They all jumped out, beat out the fire with their burlap bag. When it was all over, the oil company representative handed the fellow the check and said, What's the first thing you're going to do with all this money? Oh, I think we better fix the brakes on the truck.
The approaching summer is pushing temperatures ever higher, and the seasonal shamal wind is whipping up the sand. Hot sandstorms are blowing off the desert at over 60 miles an hour, blotting out visibility and making work impossible. In the oil fields, the firefighters are still complaining about shortages of equipment. The easiest fires were tackled first. They were capped at the rate of one a day. Now it's fallen to one a week. Some wells, like 120, are taking far longer. The twisted wellhead has defied every effort to remove it. Now Raymond has rigged a steel cable, dragging it back and forth as a makeshift saw to cut off the wellhead. It's been cutting a little over 40 hours now, and it possibly have cut off late this afternoon. It could cut off within the hour. Or if not, it'll be tomorrow, you know. It's, and it should, should, within one to two days after it's cut off, we'll have it kept. But the days pass, and the cable is making little impact. Elsewhere in the oil field, other wells are slowing down the firefighting effort. The well that ACE is working on now has a lot of ground fire, and that's time consuming. Putting out this, this probably the size of six or eight football fields of uh, ground fire there, and they have to extinguish that first, and that takes time. Many of the wells were gushing thick oil that never totally caught fire. It spread over the sand, creating a thick layer of tar, burning fitfully and creating dense choking clouds of smoke that obscured any sight of the burning well. The easiest fires were in the Ahmadi field, but during July and August, attention turned to Burgan, the largest oil field in Kuwait and one of the most congested in the world. Individual wells are so close together, it's been impossible to tell exactly how many are burning. Bagan is going to be the most dangerous field the firefighters have to face. I'm going to pull down and show you this other well as we pass this. Uh, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about, or what you mentioned, locations close together. Wind will be very, very critical when we start this work. And the, the reason for it, the wind's out of the northwest at the present time and stays there. And uh, that particular well over there won't bother us. But you take this well right here, it'll have to be extinguished before we can do this one. Because if the wind changes and blows the oil that way, uh, it'll reignite. As you can see, it gets darker and darker in the South Bergen. And if we could go, which we can't, about two more miles, it is a total blackout. I've been in there with a helicopter a couple of times. And uh, in fact, we got lost in there in the helicopter and just had to come out on instruments. That's how dark it is. Uh, you can see them burning in the, the smoke. It's a mess. This country will never be the same down in this part of the area. It's, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it'll be wrecked for years to come. You can see the problem we're going to have with uh, some of these wells out in the lakes of oil. Now they're going to have to build roads to them, just like an island, to work on them. You can see we're going to come to the end of the road. They won't let anyone really go too much farther south. By the beginning of July, 170 wells have been capped, but no one knows how many were on fire to begin with and how many are still ablaze. We've been told 600, then we've been told 500, we've been told 700. I don't think anyone really knows what, you know, the number of wells. Yeah, somewhere now, uh, somewhere between 450 and 550. And that 
because we really don't know exactly how many they are uh, were originally. Well, the report we got uh, yesterday was 732 wells on fire. There was, uh, I think, 80 of them blowing out. That of yesterday, there's been 168 wells brought under control. The figure of over 700 blazing wells is 200 more than anyone had previously admitted. After four months of dangerous, painstaking work, hundreds of wells were still gushing fire and acrid smoke. And with vital equipment still inexplicably not arriving, many fires, it seemed, would be burning for months, even years. Assuming we get a reasonable increase in the amount of equipment we have to work with, uh, we can be done in a year from now, or less perhaps. We don't have any more than we have right now, two years. Well 120 again, and yet another attempt by Raymond to tame the fire. This time, a large pipe is lowered over the flames. The idea is to funnel the gushing oil up the pipe like a chimney. If this works, the flame will be raised higher and water can be pumped into the base and the flames snuffed out. After an hour, the water supply is running out and the fire is still as fierce as ever. The firefighters call it a day and well 120 goes on burning. One more well. I was telling you earlier, it's kind of hard to get excited when you know you've got another three or four hundred to go. <laughs> While the battle to beat the fires continues, there's growing concern about the catastrophic environmental impact of the burning oil fields. William Riley, head of the US Environmental Protection Agency, pays a lightning visit to Kuwait in the run-up to congressional hearings in Washington about the global repercussions of the fires. He stops off at well 120, together with what is left of Kuwait's foreign press. I'm here to uh, get a sense for the president of of the condition of the environment, the kinds of Nord metal needs that exist, what we, along with the rest of the world community, might be able to bring to this problem. Well, I've never seen anything like this before, and certainly never seen it up close. The experience of walking down, feeling it rattle and shake from under you, the thunder building up as you get closer to it, and then the tremendous heat. I suppose we were 50 feet away from, well, and I'm told it's 2,300 degrees at the center. It's, uh, it's a kind of environmental history that's been made here, not a good environmental history, but it's been made, and uh, we're concerned to try to do what we can to help Kuwait, just as we helped win the war, help win the peace. The environment's a very important part of that. Early fears about disastrous effects on the monsoons and other global weather systems have so far proved exaggerated. But what if the fires refuse to die? Already the citizens of Kuwait have felt the calamitous effects of living beneath poisoned clouds with the prospect of slow death as they breathe in the mixture of soot and unburned oil. In August, Scientists were making computer predictions on the expectation that the fires would burn for a year or even two. At a conference in Harvard, the conclusions they presented were alarming. It depends on the mass loadings that you would get on a particular sample. You'd have to sometimes monitor. We've looked at three scenarios that would have the wells out in one, two, and three years into the future from the time uh, that the wells started burning. When I look at, a, at a, uh, the surface of the Earth, 4,000 kilometers or 5,000 kilometers on a side, and look at the potential impact in, in terms of uh, destruction of 
of plants, human health impacts over an area that large, my reaction is that's rather dramatic. The fallout from the fires, not only soot, but sulfur, acid rain, and poisonous heavy metals could affect agriculture and the people dependent on it over vast areas of the globe. And we're looking at the total accumulated soot after 18 months projected to be on the ground uh, due to the wildfires. You see two areas of concentration. One centered over Kuwait uh, with, a, with a large uh, deposition to the north, as well as an area of increased deposition over Thailand. At well 120, the battle against the fire intensifies, this time with 400 pounds of dynamite. It fails. In August, each firefighting company brings a third extra team to Kuwait. The work speeds up. Also, after intervention by the Crown Prince, the haggling over commissions and agency fees in Kuwait is resolved. The long-delayed machinery and equipment floods into Kuwait. The number of wells capped rises to six a day as the fires give way under the onslaught of money and resources. We could see some progress being made at that time, you know, that, uh, we're getting things down uh, more or less into a system. Uh, the support was a lot better. We were able to uh, have water, which we didn't have initially. And everything started falling together. The transportation got better. The, uh, the amount of equipment coming in got better. And uh, just the logistics was just totally a new world. And as we went, we got smarter. We found better ways to do it. If this lake of oil would have uh, ignited, we'd have we have been here for, I don't know how long, trying to put out the lake power to get to the well. As, as it turned out, everything fell in our direction, and, and we, we got this one well in one day. It, it looks like a totally different country from what I saw when I got here 60 days. The impact is obvious. In the Bagan field, where fires were so close together it was impossible to count them, the horizon is clear, and a handful of fires remain. Extra resources really did make a difference, and the firefighters themselves are surprised by the speed at which they work. In September, other firefighting teams joined the veterans from North America. This well is being tackled by men from Kuwait. At first, their attempts to douse the flames end in failure. Then, at a second attempt, they succeed, and black oil flows instead of sheets of fire. Other wells are being dealt with by teams from half a dozen countries. The Hungarian team attracts much media attention with its exotic Master Blaster, a bizarre contraption made from two jet engines mounted on an old tank chassis, blasting atomized water into the fire at 600 miles an hour. Even the Russians are here, though they blame their late arrival on Kuwaiti bureaucracy. 
We were invited in May, but we only actually arrived here in September. I don't know what the situation is with the other teams. We felt that uh, we should uh, invite these uh, countries, uh, of course, which have the experience in uh, the firefighting. And uh, uh, quickly they respond and we negotiated quickly. Everything was so disorganized and there was so much bureaucracy. We were ready to come in May, but when we finally arrived at our jobs, we realized that it would all soon be over. We started our work on the 16th, and we have put out four so far. Yes, this is our last well. Even in the oil fields to the north of Kuwait, just a few fires remain, and bare desert stretches to the far horizon. Nobody had expected that the work could be done so quickly, not even the firefighters with their expertise. We thought that, uh, particularly in the case of uh, uh, certain Marat gas wells, the Rotatane wells, that we would find that prolonged exposure to open flow would have uh, created lots more erosion problems than it did, and it did not. And we thought that the type of charges that were being set off uh, would create some mechanical problems within the wellbore that they did not. Uh, these were all overestimations on our part. Uh, the wells simply were not as difficult to deal with as we, uh, as we believed before we had any real history of dealing with them. In October, the fires were put out at a faster and faster rate. Well after well was extinguished and capped. Even well 120 was tamed and the flow of oil controlled. An incredible effort has succeeded in doing a job that people originally had predicted would take years. It had taken just eight months. Many had said that the only people who would benefit from this catastrophe were the firefighters, that they would take their time on a job they saw as a huge money spinner at least in the case of wild well control. Um, uh, we uh, at first proposed uh, on a well-by-well -well basis, and uh, it was rejected in favor of a daily rate uh, framework, which in the end is what was negotiated with each of these companies. And uh, as far as wild well is concerned, we would have just as soon had it on a well-by-well -well basis. Uh, I think it shows the astute uh, powers of the Kuwaitis to have decided on a daily rate. The hellfires of Kuwait were the biggest challenge ever posed to firefighters of the oil industry. There were times when some thought they would fail and the fires would burn forever. But the fires were put out. And now for the men who did it, there are mixed emotions as the work comes to an end. Everyone here is a bit tired, ready to go, ready to see the project end on the one hand, and on the other hand, have some reservations about it. And uh, uh, certainly some among us, if we could just keep it going, uh, would do so. I have no doubt about it. Why is that? I suppose it's like the baker or the chef. If it's what you do and you like to do it, and uh, uh, you hate to see the project end. It's been a, a tremendous project, one that we'll never see again in our life. And uh, we've enjoyed it for the most part. And, and uh, like I say, all of our guys have gone to, uh, you know, scot free with no injuries, and, and uh, which is really important. Oh, yes, absolutely. There's not a well over here worth one man's life. That, that's the bottom dollar.